Well, hello there, and welcome. I'm Heather, host of all nearly 18 years of the Craft Lit Podcast, and I have a story to tell you. This goes back to the early days when online could only mean either AOL or Prodigy, or if you had a pocket protector, CompuServe, when local bulletin boards were the only free way to digitally communicate with other people. And let me tell you, when CatNet appeared on the scene, it was the most thrilling thing because your local bulletin board could go online at midnight and send emails, not local messages, to people in other cities. Yes, even though I lived in Los Angeles, I could write to and receive a message from someone in New York City, possibly in under 36 hours. Back then, against this fledgling digital landscape, I was a fresh-faced new teacher who, like most new teachers, knew everything and was a genius. And then into my classroom slouches Michael. When he does talk to me, he talks about wanting to be a writer, but I don't see a whole lot of writing from him, especially not handwriting. So mid-year, I start working after school every day with the student literary magazine editors, which is lovely. They were witty, they were funny, they were too smart for their own good. And one day, one of them brings me this stapled packet of four printed out submissions, three poems and one short story. And she wasn't sure what to do with them because she said they didn't look like a student wrote them. I agreed. And genius me, I had no idea what to do. But I did know one thing. Reference librarians know everything. So I paid a visit to the college from which I had just gotten my teaching credential, and I found that yes, two of the three poems were lesser known sonnets from, I am not kidding you, William Shakespeare, both signed by Michael. The third poem we couldn't find a source for, but now that I knew that two of the four submissions were plagiarized, I was on the hunt. The carnality of the ensuing hunt was not rooted in the stereotypical motivations of soul-crushing nasty teachers who just wanted to punish students. I wanted to save Michael. Here's a kid who's told me he wants to be a writer who apparently hasn't grokked what it could mean if he were caught doing this professionally, who also apparently was not bright enough to realize that other adults may have read Shakespeare. So his chances of getting away with more of this was slim to none in my estimation. So after a few bookstore consultations over the final poem and the short story, I got an actual bright idea. Crowdsource the text search. I wrote a post on America Online on a message board explaining the situation, including the two already identified Shakespeare poems. Then I typed out the first stanza and the first paragraph of the last two mystery pieces. And I made it very clear that I did not want to get this kid into trouble. I wanted to help him before he got into trouble. Paving the way for our current internet culture, most people on the chat board attacked me for being a horrible teacher who just wants to shut kids down and gets off on telling them that they will never, ever be a writer. Yeah, just in case you thought modern commenting practices were new, they're not. However, the next day, I did get a very interesting direct message from someone who worked at a place called Dangerous Visions. Dangerous Visions was a much-beloved science fiction bookstore in the Valley in Los Angeles, and it was named with Harlan Ellison's blessing, by the way. So yes, I had just received a direct message from an employee at Dangerous Visions who recognized the opening to the short story. He said he thought he could locate the original, and if I'd be okay giving him my school mailing address, he'd send whatever he found if he found anything. And he said it might take up to two weeks to hear back from him. Four days later, I am holding a folded semi-glossy comic store poster, which had some scantily clad woman holding what Han Solo wished he could have shot Greedo with. On the back of the poster was the full and complete short story. I went through it word for word and felt sicker and sicker with every line. Michael had painstakingly typed out the entire story, changing nothing. I had no idea what to do. I spoke with my mentor teacher, and she told me I had to go to the principal with this, and he called Michael, his mother, and me into his office after school the next day. The shock of what happened next has left me with only a hazy memory of the entirety of this meeting, but I still remember the highlights. Michael's mother told the principal and me, to our faces, and to the dated and professionally printed poster, that she didn't know what we thought we were doing, but that she had watched Michael write that story at the kitchen table. I do recall pointing out that I was sure she did see him typing the story, but that he didn't write it. This did not compute. Eventually, she did say she knew where the Shakespeare poems came from. She had a complete works of Shakespeare at home, but she would not budge on the origin of the short story. My biggest concern at this point was that everything I'd seen from Michael, remember it had all been typed, even in-class handwritten assignments were turned in the next day typed, that everything might have been copied from somewhere else. My solution, which I still stand by, 
was that I didn't care about the little things, but the two big essays assigned so far needed to be drafted with me in the room. A typed final draft was fine, but the drafting needed to be done in the room with me, especially because my suspicion was that he did actually need some help. I said I'd stay in at lunch or after school or even come in early. I would make it work around Michael's schedule, and I didn't care how long it took. We had until the end of the semester. If he drafted those two essays with me and handed in final typed versions, then I would replace the zeros with his new scores and he would be able to pass the class. His mother agreed, even though she was still fighting us on having written the short story, but he never showed up. Every day he said he would, but he didn't. So why was I compelled to tell you this story? If you regularly visit YouTube and have spent any time enjoying video essays made by indie creators, it is very likely that you have caught H. Bomber Guy's expansive and beautifully researched video on YouTube plagiarism, which dropped in December of 2023. This was followed immediately by Todd and the Shadows' own separately researched but thoughtfully timed video. They talked to each other about it. And if you have not seen these epic feats of video research, and really you should, this will all make much more sense to you if you do. I've included links to them in the show notes below, as well as the other videos and creators which I'll be mentioning shortly. In fact, my entire list of references is below, including a link to a PDF of the Chicago Manual of Style formatted works consulted page. There have already been many, and there will be many more, reaction videos to Harris's original examination of YouTube plagiarism, as well as one very important non-response but similarly themed video from Philosophy Tube that happened to be released close to Mr. Bomber Guy's video. It's like the Craftlet Zeitgeist phenomenon has expanded to the whole world. It's so fun! And in that spirit, I wanted to share some things that I've noticed about this topic, but from a classroom teacher's point of view. What's so nifty about getting a teacher's perspective on this subject? I'm glad you asked. Just like my shock at learning that doctors don't really learn much about menopause, a thing that will happen to literally half of the humans on this planet, no one ever talked about plagiarism in my teacher training programs. I got my secondary school teaching credential from my state university program, and my other degree was a master's from a big East Coast university. And I mean, we talked about plagiarism, but not in a useful way. Like, what do you do if you catch a kid plagiarizing? What do you do if your school doesn't have a policy? on plagiarism, or worse, it has a really stupid one. How do you catch kids who are plagiarizing and then help them? And probably, most importantly, what could you do as a teacher to stop your students from plagiarizing in the first place? I know I'm not going to be able to answer all those questions today, although if you'd like me to, please leave a comment below and I'll do my best to fill that need later. Now today I am probably going to, annoyingly, be raising more questions than I answer. Because I think this is a conversation we all need to be having, and questions provoke conversation, right? So while I'm going to talk here as a teacher, I am not speaking only to teachers. I hope that makes sense. I made this for everyone. I made this for you. And obviously, I can only speak anecdotally to you from my own experiences. But at the end of this, I will sum up where I think we can go from here. Where we should go where we would go in a perfect world. I have a theory for why this is happening. I guarantee you that most YouTubers who create video essays have fallen into the plagiarism hole at some point. Quoting Wikipedia without using quotation marks, that sort of thing. Casual, low-level plagiarism. But that isn't always because they're lazy or evil. And by the way, I am not disagreeing with H. Bomber Guy. His examples of plagiarism particularly from James Somerton and Illuminati, are egregious and real and extraordinarily serious. They are also excellent examples to use in teacher training programs to help new teachers learn how to recognize the warning signs when they see them. Sometimes plagiarism happens because it's difficult and complicated to create quality content week after week, especially if it's just you doing it. For 13 years, I did all of my own research, recording, and editing for Craftlet, and it shows. Some episodes don't sound so good especially when I thought that releasing on a consistent schedule was more important than, say, sound quality. And some Craftlet episodes are short on audio annotations, sometimes because there simply wasn't that much to say about those chapters, but sometimes it was because I got busy and something had to give. And if you're a creative and ADHD, pleasing your audience really matters, way beyond great stats. For me and creators like me, 
satisfying your audience matters. So when you're lucky enough to have a wonderful audience who are devoted to the content that you make, or in my case, the annotated audiobooks we listen to together, it feels super important that you release your episodes regularly. Otherwise, folks start to worry and ping you asking, when is the episode coming? And then, is everything okay? And then, are you okay? Which is lovely when it's your people doing it, but it's not so great when it's an algorithm that is pushing you. Towards the end of the pandemic, I started to notice something happening to YouTubers who I'd been watching grow their channels throughout lockdown. I called what I was seeing content fatigue, the weekly creation of quality content that is 100% you, your ideas, your skills, your creative spark. It can be exhausting, sure, but on YouTube in particular, your ability to share your content with any size audience is driven by a mysterious and ever-changing algorithm. I'm not going to get into the weeds on that or how it functions, but I can tell you this. It is ruthless. If you're trying to make a living on YouTube or as a podcaster these days, for that matter, the pressure to get it right every time and on a regular schedule and largely on your own is insane. It's not sustainable. And since the things that make your content unique and useful and therefore cause your audience to grow are things that you and you alone bring to the table, well, you can't farm that out to anyone else. I can't farm out the research that I do myself on the books we listen to any more than Diane Antone could farm out her painting. I get it. The constant lash of the algorithm breaks people, creative people who want to share. And once you've gotten hooked, if you were lucky enough to start making money on a platform like YouTube, but then the algorithm changes and kills your new livelihood, surprise, it makes sense that you'd do whatever you could to get that back, which means more content to feed the algorithm beast. And there is no way to do that aside from burning out and stopping, unless you're willing to cut corners. Plagiarism is a really easy solution to that particular problem. And please understand, I am not condoning plagiarism. I'm trying to make the point that I saw the same kinds of problems happening in my classroom. Because in a classroom, teachers who require regular essays on specific topics and teachers who don't spend much time reading and responding to student work so that they get to know their students' unique voices and teachers who give final grades on essays period, the end, as though we were teaching written instead of writing, which is an iterative process that requires many, many drafts and lots of critical feedback, well, those teachers are being lashed by a different kind of algorithm. And so are their students. So how can a classroom teacher make it impossible for kids to plagiarize? All I can tell you is what worked for me, and I can also tell you that it ticked off several of my colleagues quite a bit. But here's what I did. You, the student, must hand in your paper on time, a complete draft. If it's in on time, then you get to revise it with my or anyone else's help up until the end of the semester. I will rescore it when you can show me that you have made a thorough revision. Get it? Revision. Not a slapdash edit or proofread that only addresses comments from me. Then whatever score you've earned on that essay by the end of that semester, that is the score that goes into the gradebook. They are not averaged together. You learned and revised and put in the time to earn that higher grade. I don't care if you got a D on the first draft. If it's an A paper by the end, then you earned and deserve that A, period. That's it. That was my whole policy. For this to work, however, I never assigned busy work, and I always had the students come up with their own question to answer or element to research about the books that we read. The only times I assigned topics or prompts was when the kids practiced for the New York State English Regents exam where they had to write a particular type of critical lens essay. It's really easy to catch plagiarism when nothing on the student's paper reflects anything y'all discussed in the classroom, or when the thing they handed in uses words that they can't pronounce or explain. Obviously, this doesn't fix things here on the interwebs, but it does, I think, anyway, shine a bit of a light on how we viewers can positively push back on the dynamic that's pushing creators to choose speed over quality. And I'll point out here that Mr. Bomber Guy knows that he's in a rarefied position. He said it himself. He's been doing this forever, which means he has a lot of content, which also happens to be quite good. So in many ways, he defies the algorithm. He knows it, and he knows that most people aren't in that same category. Personally, I'd happily wait a year for his next video because I know it will be worth waiting for. But and this is an important but, I also know that YouTube will tell me when Harris Bomber Guy's next video has uploaded. 
One of the things that makes me truly appreciate Harris is how he ended his plagiarism video by sharing the profits from it with creators and the writers who got stiffed by the plagiarizers. That's a really stand-up move. I love that. I also love that in the description box he's linked out to a playlist he created called Your New Favorite YouTubers. And if anyone has built a list of where to find the non-YouTuber writers and creators books, essays, and videos so that I can support them moving forward, please share that with us in the comments. As a proud pride mom, I want to support all of the LGBTQIA creators I can, because what James Summerton did broke my heart too. Summerton, at least in the videos that I watched, always talked about being a filmmaker. I didn't learn until Harris's video that he was actually a business major, and I can tell you truly, from my heart, that that explained everything to me. Non-teachers who have been saying for the last 44 years that schools need to be run like businesses is exactly what's been killing education in this country for the last 44 years. Shortly before Christmas, Summerton released a, well, a poorly planned response video. Poor planning and tin ear aside, I actually sort of believed a couple of the things that he said early on. I really truly do not think he knew either of these two things. First, I don't think he knew that legitimate creative analysis requires not only rigorous research, but also meticulous record keeping. He, like all of the C-suite sentinels I have known, have no idea what real creation looks like. I worked in Hollywood for several years after college, and there was a pretty common joke going around. The kind of joke that's funny because it's true. It is. Every producer believes he's a writer. And every producer is wrong. And please note, the joke doesn't qualify that we're talking about quality, not comparing a producer to a great writer, just a writer. And it seems to me that this has the same vibe as policymakers and the general public's attitudes of, I too am an expert in teaching because I sat my butt in a classroom for 12 years and had teaching happen to me. This lack of understanding of the nuance of anyone who is an expert in their field has bled throughout our culture for a while now. Look, you wouldn't want me to do your taxes for you. Really, really, you wouldn't. I am not trained for that. Why would you trust someone untrained and unpracticed in the field to make decisions about education? Why trust the unpracticed and untrained to teach your child? Or create the content that you and your kids consume? And the second thing I believed Summerton on, I really believe he didn't know that what he was doing was wrong. I haven't seen the evidence of any ethics training in business programs lately. Have you? So what can we do to help push the algorithm to the side and make it less of a lash wielded on content creators and more of a nudge? A thoughtful awareness of what we do when we like, subscribe, comment, and share will help. What does that look like? Every time a viewer engages with a YouTube video, the algorithm notices that. So the more interactions, the better for the creator. This is a free way to help the creators you like. And yes, as an old school podcaster from the days when no one ever took a sponsorship from a product they didn't personally use first, I was initially horrified by all of the like and subscribe pushiness that I saw on YouTube, but I get it now. And they won't have to push so hard if we leave the Yelp review that no one ever leaves. The nice one. If the creator has a coffee or a PayPal donation link or a Patreon page, sign up. And most Patreon creators can let you sign up for free now then you can adjust your support whenever you have the time and the finances to do so. You have no money to send us support? That's fine. Like, subscribe, comment, and then share, share, and share again. Any content, any creator you discover and like, share the episodes, share the videos, and please share the indie podcasts. For us, it's like, subscribe, and leave a rating on iTunes. Even more important, help a friend learn how to subscribe. Hey. Craplet has a dedicated app. You could teach a librarian how to use the app so that they can see how many books we've covered so more high school students can have access to the support of annotated classic audiobooks. All of these options are free and very, very important. Anything you can do to help cut through the noise on the internet and help people find the good stuff, it's huge. It's crucial. If we all take a moment now and then to do something positive and supportive of indie content creators, we get to be some of the wonderful people who keep independent voices alive and posting. Something that is so important as the world becomes more homogenized and the gates of the gatekeepers keep getting bigger and stronger. Be a patron of the arts you love in whatever way you can. 
Because to survive this creative burnout, we creators are going to have to kick it old school, the way podcasters, not procasters, have always had to do. And a sidebar, podcasters and procasters. Procasters are defined by me as voices and faces who started podcasting in a professional studio, who were paid by a company that they didn't start. Basically, companies that use the name podcast and the free podcast distribution network as a way to sound more of the people than they actually are. These shows are often scripted or at least content constrained, and if you want to know more, you can listen to my 2015 episode from when this first started happening. You can also watch the excellent Tom Nicholas's video on YouTubers holding their own microphones. This video is not going to get millions of views. It is not going to make me any money, and it isn't sponsored, but it is 100% me. And right now, that is the only guarantee I can give to the people who watch and listen to the content that I create, and who have supported me any way they can for the last 17 years. Procasters, who I loosely define as those who started on and continue to be supported by legacy media, they don't need you to buy their merch or support them on Patreon or share their episodes for them to survive. They're recording in professional studios, and those shows and studios are making money in other ways. But podcasters, podcasters sure need your support. I hope I'm remembering this correctly, but I seem to recall the marvelous voice of Brenda Dane in my ear, who really kicked the knitting podcast world into high gear along with Knitcast. I believe she once said back in the late aughts, if everyone who listened to the show donated a dollar an episode, I would be able to do this full time and get you more quality audio more often. And if I am remembering this correctly, she also lost listeners after saying that. She had said the quiet part out loud, the part no one said back then that content creators need financial support if you want to keep hearing their content. We need benevolent Medicis. When teaching moved from being a job mostly held by men to positions that were filled mostly by women who had been trained in normal schools, not universities, suddenly teaching wasn't so much a career anymore as a vocation. Administrators and policymakers know that teachers will do almost anything to help their students. Believe me when I tell you that I never actually made more than $5.78 an hour for my teaching time. All that free work that I did, not in my contract, but definitely impossible to do the job well without it. You can bet real cash money on the fact that the people writing the contracts and creating the policies and requirements for that job expected that free work from me. Because they know I'll do whatever I can to help my students. It's what teachers do. Teaching and creative content creation, they are callings, no question. But teacher burnout is real, and so is creator burnout. So yeah, teachers, if you're noticing a lot of plagiarism in your classroom, think about what you can do to change it up to make it less likely, or at least less easy, for the kids to cheat like that. I guarantee the level of engagement will go up and you'll have a better time in the classroom, and the kids will too. For anyone who's still watching who isn't a teacher, thank you, if you find content you like, please support that creator any way you can. Craftlet has a little merch store now, too. Since I got long COVID last year, the podcast is the only income I've got. And by income, I mean it's the only way I can pay the podcast bills. I don't actually make money, not yet, but merch seems to be the way of the future, so thither that lash pushes me, and thither I go. I think perhaps our immediate responses to stories of bad behavior focus a little bit too much on the personal evils of the plagiarizers. What matters is that this doesn't happen again, and we won't stop plagiarism through hate campaigns. The algorithms of not just YouTube, but all social media are built to encourage theft in many, many forms. It's speed over quality. By focusing on the character of Somerton or Illuminati and not factoring in the environment in which they create, we ignore the truth of the matter and our culpability in it. This is a solvable problem, and the solution is simple. Use your engagement as a holy weapon with which to smite those undeserving of your attention as well as a means by which we heap praise and success on worthy creators. We know clickbait. We understand what it is and how it works, and we can see it from a mile away. So why do we still click? If we use our engagement as the tool that it's meant to be used as, we can generally exercise our control over the algorithms we so dearly hate. And through that, the creators that we want to see create can do so without worrying how they're going to be able to afford groceries next week. 
Our behavior affects their content, just like teacher, administrator, and policy decisions drive the content that students create. Clickbait begets more clickbait. What we reinforce creates the world around us. When we respond to fantastic documentaries like the one by Mr. Bomber Guy, I would like to encourage us to follow the wisdom of Benjamin Franklin and doubt a little of our own infallibility when pointing out the bad behavior of others and make sure we're not doing something that makes that bad behavior possible, or worse, lucrative. A big thank you to my patrons whose names you should now be seeing on this screen. I couldn't do what I do without you. Thank you.